I first, before we get started, um, I would like to recognize that I presently occupy the ancestral land of the Andina culture, the Hopewell culture, and the Monongahela peoples, as well as the refugees who fled uh, from the colonizers, including the Delaware, the Shawnee, uh, the Iroquois. Uh, I want to honor the tradition of the native people and the native lands that I sit on at this moment that I occupy, and I'm really grateful. I want to pay my respect to their elders in the past, present, and in the future, including their community and culture. And so I know that we cannot change the past, but we can commit to continued gratitude for the gifts of nature, along with ongoing respect, care, and stewardship of the land for us, the water, and the stewardship of each other and future generations. So for a moment, if you know whose land you're occupying, just show some gratitude. Hello all, my name is Richard Butler, as you saw on the prompt. Uh, I'm looking forward to having this conversation. Uh, can we have the next slide? Sam will be operating the slides. Next slide, Sam. And so I wanted to set the tone for today's conversation. And um, in the, setting this tone, I would like to do a, a grounding that I call you are a bright light. And so if you want to participate, sit on the edge of your seat or go ahead and sit on the floor or wherever you are, stand up if you have to, whatever your abilities are. Uh, we're gonna close our eyes. If you're comfortable with closing your eyes, if you're not comfortable with closing your eyes, then uh, that's fine too, but find, find your comfort. And I want you to begin to just silence, silence your mind, silence your mind as you see a flat lake first thing in the morning without a ripple. And some people think that awareness exercise means emptying your mind, but we can't empty our mind. That's just dumb but we can recognize what's in our mind. We can recognize our thoughts. And so in this grounding, I want you to take three deep breaths in through the nose, out through your mouth. In, out, In, out. Relax your shoulders and for a moment do a body scan. Some of us may have had to work today. Some of us may have been cramped up at home. Uh, depending upon who you are, there may be stressors, there may not be stressors. So I want you to take a body scan and just recognize how you feel right now. I want you to feel the floor. I want you to feel the sofa. I want you to feel the chair or the pillow press up against you and you press against it. Inhale, please. Exhale. And as you feel the weight of gravity pulling you towards the floor and the floor pushing up against you, I want you to feel the weight of your feet, the bones in your ankle, your shins, your knees, your thighs. I want you to really pay attention and scan your hips and your glutes as they take up the space. And if you're standing, feel the weight that's on your feet. And I want you to scan up your waist to your chest, your shoulders, your arms, your, your face, relax your face. And take one big inhale here. And exhale. And I want you to join me in drawing a circle, an imaginary circle around your heart. And as you imagine that circle around your heart, I want you to imagine that there's a bright light shining out for all to see. And I want you to take a moment and just sit with this light coming from your heart. Who does your light attract? Breathe rhythm, rhythmically on your own. 
And I now want you to imagine the five people, and you may have more, but I want five people that you love the most. And I want you to place them at the top of your circle around your heart. And those are the people that you'll do anything for and they'll do anything for you. Who are those people? And if you look, they also have a light. And if you really, really stretch your imagination, you can feel the warmth of their light coming from their hearts. And they can feel the light and the warmth coming from your heart. And you're attracted to each other and you protect each other and you embrace each other. And now I want you to take your mind's eye but before you do that, let's take one big deep breath for the ones that we love. With gratitude, we inhale. With love, we exhale. And now I want you to look to the right-hand corner of your circle. And just outside of your circle, almost coming into your circle, but not quite. Those are the people that you associate with every day. Maybe you leave your dorm room and you wave at the person down the hall. Maybe it's the person that delivers your wine monthly. Maybe it's your neighbor cutting the grass at six in the morning and you acknowledge them. And as you look at them a little closely, you notice that they also have a light coming from their hearts and you feel their warmth. And you may not know their name, but you recognize them. Let's take a deep breath here. Exhale. And now let's go to the bottom of our circle, way to the bottom. And now I want you to go from the bottom of your circle next to your heart and look as far as your mind's eye will allow you to see. And you will see dim lights. And those dim lights belong to the others. Those are the people that we other. Those are the people that are not part of our circle of influence or our circle of concern. Those are the people that we say, that's not my problem. But if you look, they also have a light. And they also have warmth. And they also have people that's close to them at the top of their circle within their heart. And if for a moment we found common ground and just cease othering people and instead find their light, follow their light and realize that we're human together and we all have this light and we all have this warmth and we need to draw everyone into our circle. Take three deep breaths here, in through the nose, out through the mouth. In through your nose, out through your mouth. One more time, don't rush it, enjoy it. And this time, I want you to notice the gap in between the inhale and the exhale and notice that gap and what's in that gap. Can you bring the others in that gap of silence, in the gap of your breath? Inhale, keep going. Now hold it, hold it, feel the warmth, see the light. Now let it go with gratitude and love. And for a moment, I want you to sit with this idea of who have you othered and who have othered you and how can we do better? As we set the tone for this conversation, this conversation is not going to be about how you're going to recruit a more diverse athletic pool. This is a conversation about who you are in the space of social and racial injustice. It's a conversation about discovering you self-reflecting on who you are in this space and how can you be better in this space. And when you're ready, flicker your eyes open if they were closed 
If not, bring your gaze back to my face on, on the webinar. And I wanna just say thank you all for allowing me to set this tone. Thank you all for allowing me to be here. Next slide, please. And so I want to let you read this. We're gonna have a brave space agreement. I'll read a couple of these. If you get to speak or if you get to be in the, in the chat room, I want you to use I statements, speak from I and share your own perspective versus sharing a generalized point of view. Don't say, don't say those people and they often do this and they that, don't other the others. Confidentiality, what's shared here stays here. What's learned here leaves here. Take, a, take away lessons and themes while protecting identities and stories. And this one is important, intentional listening. You know, are you listening or are you just waiting your turn to speak? Practice being present, practice being interested and not interesting. Listen with openness and intent to understand not necessarily the intent to respond. And I love this brave space agreement. If you take space, please make space. I know that you might have a lot to say, but we have introverts, we have people with different abilities, we have people who respond at different pace, allow others to also have space, but it's okay for you to also take space. Expect unfinished business. We are not going to, we are not going to solve racism in this call and embrace your personal discomfort. I am not here to make you uncomfortable on purpose, but some of you will be triggered and will be uncomfortable. And I need you to know that in this brave space, it is to create a space where racism can be discussed with candor, care, and courage. This space is not meant to solve racism. It can't. It is meant to provide a platform for beginning or continuing the work of understanding, acknowledging, and unlearning internal biases, fragilities, and prejudices, and prejudices in addition to systemic and institutional racism that's within our own group and greater society. And so in the chat, if you agree to the Brave Space Agreements, just go ahead and agree, agree to that or send a raised hand that you agree and then bring your hand back down and then we'll continue. Thank you for those that agree. Thank you for those who may not be able to agree via chat, but you can agree uh, just with your heart. And I hope during the grounding and the setting the tone that right away, you got a golden nugget of who you have been in the space of othering. And once we decide in our intentional of growing our circle of concern, we'll begin to make a dent in society and all become anti-racist. Next slide, please. And so our agenda today, why am I qualified to lead this session? It's gonna be all about me. When, when Sam asked me, what was the next webinar going to be about? I was like, how about me? So here we are, no panelists, just me versus you. We'll do a little bit of historical, how did we get here? We'll talk about some distinctions and definitions. We'll do a, a, a call to action and I'll finish with the moral of the story. And so before we continue, as I acknowledge the indigenous people whose land that I occupy, I also wanna acknowledge all people who have hatred thrown your way based on your based on the fact that maybe you don't identify with your assigned gender maybe because of your abilities or disabilities your gender your class and society asian americans have really been getting a brunt of hate so you know the anti asian hate transphobia. As I speak today, I speak with an umbrella 
of, of, of anti-hate across the board, but I identify as a black person and I will be talking specifically about my lived experiences, not all black people's lived experiences. I will be talking specifically about the reason why we have diversity, equity, inclusion training. We have these type of conversations because in 1964, 1968, 1968, black people were finally allowed to go in the workplace with white people and the white people needed training. And so that's the original and many, 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 many of Americans and non-Americans have benefited from this fact that DEI, diversity, equity, inclusion, and belonging training stems from black and white in America. Next slide, please. She's going for it. All right. So let me tell you um, a quick, just a real quick, my story of how I'm qualified to be here today and maybe some of my lived experience. And so I uh, have been a college professor for 15 years at Robert Morris University here in Pittsburgh. And in those 15 years, I've taught in the School of Leadership. And my primary class, although I teach organizational ethics, leadership one and two, argument and research, my number one class that I enjoy and that has um, changed year after year is managing and understanding diversity in the workplace. I've also been a diversity, equity, inclusion and belonging uh, consultant for the last 18 years. But all of that comes from this story. And so if you wanna close your eyes, fine. If you don't, that's fine. Again, if you're not comfortable with that, but I want you to imagine this fact. I was born in 1958, so I was born into the Jim Crow laws. And so my parents had already been living with the Jim Crow laws. And if you're still unfamiliar with that, basically they created separate but equal. We could not go where white people went. And we have substandard, um, substandard and intentional um, representation, a, a negative representation in society. By the time I was seven, we finally ended the Jim Crow law. So I want you to sit with this idea just for a moment. I'm not gonna talk to you about 400 years ago. That was gruesome, that was horrible. We can't deny that we as human beings, that human colonizers, that white Europeans were awful. That's another conversation. But because it's 400 years ago, you tend to other that group. So I'm gonna bring it right up to 50 years ago. I'm gonna bring it right up to 60 years ago. I'm gonna tell you that someone in your family, a relative, a neighbor, a friend, was either on the right side of the law of Jim Crow laws or the wrong side, either benefited from it or fought it. That's a fact. And you can sit with that for a moment. When I was 10, and to this day I suffer trauma and PTSD, Dr. Martin, Luther, Dr. Martin Luther King was assassinated. And I heard the sirens and my family heard the fires and, and, and heard the sirens. And we stood out in the middle of our street in Homewood, PA in Pittsburgh. And it looked like the forest fires of California. It was burning to the ground. And people were crying and people were angry. At that time, they were really angry because we were told if we were peaceful, everything would be all right. And we were told if we were nonviolent, everything would be all right. But Dr. King was killed anyway. And as a 10 year old, to this day, I vividly remember smelling 
and still smell the smoke burning from burning tires of cars, hearing glass break, hearing the thud of billy clubs of the National Guard beating Black people, hearing the marching boots of the National Guards march through our streets in step, in uniform, beating down the threat of upset and sad and angry people, the dogs tearing apart my neighbors. My eyes were bright, my eyes were wide, I was terrified, and that informed me for a lifetime of activism. And, and go ahead in the chat, I'm gonna stop there with the storytelling. In the chat, tell me what you're feeling. What are your thoughts right now? 50 years, 60 years, not 400 years. Yes, yeah, sadness, embarrassment, anger, stunned, right? Stunned. Your heart is heavy. Yeah. Horror. I wish I could go back in time and change things. I am thankful that you were able to tell us your story and how sad it is. Thank you for that, Rebecca. I tell you my truths. Yes, thank you about Rodney Kane. Very sober. Upset, grief, and thankful that I'm sharing the experience. Thank you for that. Sad and gut-wrenching. Thank you, William Willard. Memories of watching on TV. Yes, grateful. Yeah, we, we think this is a TV thing. You know, um, Mr. Floyd died. Mr. Floyd was murdered. And social media actually captured that. Back when I was a child, we had three television networks in black and white with an antenna on the television. And for the longest, the television networks never covered what was happening to black people who were protesting peacefully throughout America. Television never covered it. One day, one, tele one network decided to cover young college kids getting beat getting bit by dogs, being blasted by fire hoses because they wanted to sit in a diner with white people. That was our social media. And that's when white people came up in arms and became allies and advocates and accomplice. Next slide, please. How did we get here? And learn what you think you know. You know, um, we talked a little bit about slavery. I'm not going to dwell on that. It's horrible. But I also wanted to recognize, again, our indigenous people. Uh, in 1491, there are estimates of anywhere from one, one, 60 million to 145 million indigenous people in North America, including Canada. And today in the United States, we have 4.5 million indigenous people. And so we have to unlearn who we think we, who, who, who we are in this space. That we have to unlearn that one group of people thought democracy was having power over another, over another group of people. We have to unlearn for black people specifically that the myth that we were physically different and racially different is simply a myth. And to this day, medical doctors still believe that. We have to unlearn that people that don't look like you are in, inferior. The narrative is, is, is really structurally built into the democracy of what our founding fathers created. 
the narrative that one group of people is superior and another is inferior, all based on the economy with cotton and sugar and rice that built this nation on the backs of people that don't look like you, but look like me. We have to learn that, unlearn what we've learned, and we need to be really mad about the fact that to this day, people are fighting to have history, not erase founding fathers history, but to add the other side of the story to history. Next slide, please. And by the way, this is normally a two hour talk that's back and forth. So I met this little dude in Memphis, Tennessee. I did a uh, learn to row with the Memphis uh, basketball team foundation. And we had thousands of people show up and he came late and he wanted to get on an indoor rower and I let him on. And I'll, I'll never forget that little dude. He was so happy to row. And so I'm not gonna go over this whole distinctions, but I wanna talk about the three A's because it's, it's, it's not understood. So actor, ally, and accomplice. An actor, most recent is a bystander and they put up a black square during the death of Mr. Floyd for Black Lives Matter. An ally, interesting enough, is not something that you appoint yourself to be. Based on your actions, people of color and people who don't identify with their assigned birth and people with disabilities decide that you're an ally based on your actions, not based on you saying that you're an ally. An accomplice, they're at the front line taking blows. They are in the hallways of city council and city hall. They are in the PTA meetings telling white liberals that no, the rules and the policies that you create actually only serves you. We need to shift from this idea from me to we. When we begin to bring everyone into our light, into our circle, into the warmth, in, into the embrace them against our chest as a we, that we're in this together, that's when we're gonna make a dent and become anti-racist. And I need my allies that have been assigned as allies and my accomplice, accomplices to stop calling out. No one's listening and start calling them in and educating with historical facts. Educating with storytelling. Definition, anti-racist. Before I go on, are there any thoughts about what I just said about the three A's? Actor, ally, accomplice, just throw it in the chat really quick. We're gonna stay engaged. Did someone get an aha moment and go, oh, I didn't know that. Oh, I learned something. How important your actions are as an ally. Thank you, Rebecca. You're welcome for the distinction, Sarah. Uh, Terry Light, stop calling out. No one's listening. I love it. Thank you for being engaged. Distinctions are good. Yes, Kate, thank you. Next slide. So anti-racist, a belief or doctrine that rejects the supremacy of one racial group over another and promotes racial equality in society. And, and so if I were to say, raise your hand, if you're not a racist, go ahead and raise your hand. I don't know if I can see your hands. Um, so I'll say in the chat, if you're not a racist, go ahead and say, you're not a racist. Normally these sessions are face to face. Yes, you're not a racist. Thank you, Mark. I'm not a racist. I'm not a racist. Yes, Michael. 
I'm not. Yes. You know, I told you in the beginning of this, thank you. Thank you all that are saying I'm not a racist. I said in the beginning um, that this conversation today is about who you are, not about who your boathouse is, but hopefully what your growing program will become. And we have to call it as we see it. And we have to look in the mirror and identify where we've been in this space. And so for all of you that said you're not a racist, there are even more Americans and non-Americans that say they're not racist. And with that statement alone, because they proclaim that they're not a racist, they don't do anything about racism. What I need for you to be is an anti-racist. Once you proclaim that you're anti-racist, that you have a belief or a doctrine that rejects the supremacy of one racial group over another and promotes racial equality in society. My Jewish friends, too many hundreds of years of needing to reject supremacy over your religion. We need to be anti-racist. Next slide. You know, someone said they don't think they have racist thoughts, but I can't say that I don't have fiscal responses. And so part of being an anti-racist is that you're not benefiting from a racist system or someone that you know is actually benefiting from a racist structure. And so I'm gonna take a few moments. I'm not gonna insult you. Um, I'll read one or two just in case you are visually impaired and you can't see this. Um, but for those of you who don't have a, who can see this, feel free to read it to yourselves. Um, microaggressions is important around the boathouse, around the docks. And there's a whole lesson plan that I can give you for an hour about microaggressions and macroaggressions, but I'll just give you this definition. Microaggressions are defined as verbal, behavioral, and environmental indignities that communicate hostile, derogatory, or negative racial slights and insults to target person or group. And you could pretty much, some of you will be able to put in the chat examples of microaggressions. But I love the one where people don't understand when they tell me that I speak well, how insulting that is for me. And someone's gonna ask why, but we're not gonna debate that here. In institutional racism refers specifically to the ways in which institutional policies and practices create different outcomes for different racial groups. Yes, be more aware of your blind spots, absolutely. disparate impact, desperate impact. Thanks for keeping the chat alive. Yeah, so thank you for the interpretation, Terry. Well-spoken equals talk like a white person. Hmm. Next slide, please. So this is important and we don't talk about it a lot, but we need to talk about it because I don't care how, with, with few exceptions, and for those of you who know me, you know that I was, the, I was the first ever, and I'm gonna emphasize black because I identify as black, not African-American, and the first black person to be an executive director of a rowing program in America, and to this day, the last, and the first inclusion manager for US rowing, and right now, the only. And so I've spent a lot of years in this space. And although many of my programs across the country, and I've been in boathouses where I've been the first ever to set foot in that 100 year old boathouse, and I had never felt psychologically safe in that boathouse, although they welcomed me because I wore a US rowing logo. And that was my privilege with the U.S. Rowing logo. That's how I got in the door. That was my badge of honor. But 
you may say that we're inclusive, Richard, at our, in our rowing program. But have you asked your rowers of colors? Have you asked your um, athletes who are disabled or your athletes who um, may uh, not identify with their assigned birth gender? Have you asked them, do they feel safe? Psychological safety is a belief that you won't be punished or humiliated for speaking up with ideas, questions, or concerns or mistakes. When you have psychological safety in the workplace, people feel comfortable being themselves. They bring their full selves to work and feel okay to work or the boathouse and feel okay laying all of themselves on the line. And so what I mean by that is when I've done hundreds, I've worked with several thousand people, several thousand, and I mean five to 6,000 people since Mr. Floyd died. And when I have people of color on the calls and we ask this question about their workspace or their boathouse, the people that are not of color are surprised that they don't feel psychologically safe to be within that boathouse that they don't show up themselves, that they turn down and turn off their music in the car, and that they speak a certain way so that they could be safe within the space. And so are you creating brave, safe space as we created here today? Are you creating psychologically safe boathouse rowing program? And so there are four steps to being psychologically safe, safe, but I'm not gonna go through those today. But this is something important as you do this anti-racism work with yourself, but then as you bring it to the boathouse, as you begin to bring people that may not be like you, that you've othered in the past, people with the same light and the same warmth and that are human just like you, are they actually feeling like they belong? And that's why I always add, you know, belonging became part of diversity, equity, inclusion, and belonging. Do people feel like they belong? Do you have a welcoming space? And have you actually asked? And, be, and you have to be very careful when you're asking this question. You have to be familiar because it's also insulting to walk up to a person of color or someone who identifies differently. And so you have to also understand your audience and understand um, and, and also be prepared to step in it, to be prepared to make a mistake, be prepared to apologize. Because right now I step in it still when it comes to pronouns, but you know what? Every day I'm getting better and every day I'm learning and I'm learning you know, sexual orientation and gender identity and expression. I'm learning that there's a spectrum that we can't just pigeonhole people in, in, in one area of this spectrum. And so we need to learn that if we wanna create safe space, safe, brave space for our athletes, for our members, for our board members. Next slide, please. So before we go to that slide, let's back up one second. Thank you, Sam. And so I'm just gonna throw out some no small talk anti-racism prompts. Now, normally I have a whole exercise around this that we do the prompts and you answer them on pencil and paper and then you select one and then you take that one prompt and you create an action step on how you're gonna be an anti-racist. And I'll walk you through that in a moment. Then I'm gonna do questions and answers. So begin to put your Q and A in the question and answers. And I would really like the Q and A to be self-reflective, personal development, professional development, not me solving your boathouse problems, but being, being authentic with you, you being authentic with me, and what things are you struggling with? So I'm going to ask a couple of questions, and I'm not going to read all of the questions. There's about 20, and you just, I want you to sit with it for a moment and respond to it. 
And the first question I have for you, and I'll do this for the next five minutes, and then we'll spend you know, the last 10 minutes just you know, chatting it up, chatting it up. How often do you think about race? Hourly, daily, weekly? How often do you think about race? Hourly, daily, weekly, never? Right, thank you for that never. I'll let you sit with that and respond either in your mind or on paper or in the chat. If you wanna be anonymous, don't put it in the chat. Barely ever, daily, 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 hourly, beautiful, weekly, weekly. I think about it all the time, hourly, yes. Yes, and this isn't interesting that there's a whole part of our population to ask why are we always talking about race? Because it's built into who we are as a society. Thank you for the weekly. Next question. Write down some of your privileges. How are you benefiting from those privileges? I know that I benefit socially by being a six foot two cis has male in society. But I don't have the same privileges as someone who may be ethnically different than me or maybe European with the same height and the same gender. Write down some of your privileges and how are you benefiting from those privileges? If you wanna throw that in the chat, throw it in the chat. House, food, education, amen to that. Opportunities, yep. You know, I always like to say this to the people who say to me, well, all lives matter. And I, I will say, I agree with you, but can you also agree with me that not all lives are equal? And that usually drops the mic in that conversation. What stereotypes do you think have been made about you? What stereotypes do you think have been made about you? Go ahead and throw that in the chat. What stereotypes do you think have been made about you? And you know, real, a very common stereotype for me because of my height and because of my race uh, where did you play basketball? You probably grew up in an underrepresented community. Most likely, I grew up in poverty. Yeah, thank you for those stereotypes coming up in the chat. Write down one area or just think about one area where you could welcome more Black indigenous and people of color voices into your life. I'll say that one more time and then we'll end there. Write down one area or just think about one area where you could welcome more black, indigenous and people of color BIPOC voices into your life. Yeah, school, school, my work everywhere and anywhere, in my boathouse, which is also my work, thank you. Community, community, yes. You know, a quick story, and then I'm gonna open it up to the Q and A. Uh, I tell people this all the time. When I was a young person, as quickly as I could walk, someone was tossing a ball my way in my neighborhood, be it a football, a basketball, or a baseball. By the time I could run, someone was inviting me to race. They were asking me to go play basketball, football. 
someone in my neighborhood or someone came to my neighborhood for those, for those ball sports, but no one ever invited me to row. And we need to be in this space that we need to begin to invite the other people that are just like us with their warmth and their brightness to row. We need to invite them in. So I'm gonna end there, ask your questions, share in the, there's an actual Q and A box. Um, I'll be able to see them. Sam will be able to see them. Sam, you could take, uh, scroll down to um, the last screen, just in case people wanna contact me. You can always DM me. You can always text me. Don't leave a voice message because I'll never listen to it. And then we could take that screen down once people do a screenshot or whatever it is that they can do with that information. I'm always open to have real conversations, authentic conversations, intentional conversations. Yeah, I have problems with racist jokes that I don't mean at all. You can take that screen down now, Sam, please, and just, just have me up. Yeah, racist jokes, they're hurtful. And we validate that it's okay actually to be racist. So thank you for putting that in the chat. How do people not of color, but can we, so when, we're, when you're asking questions, put it in the Q&A because in the chat, it disappears rapidly. Thank you. Someone wants my contact to be put up in the chat. Sam? Would love resources working with kids, skills development for addressing behavioral issues and racism around prejudices of all kinds. Thank you for that, Sarah. Uh, you can go in the chat, get my email, email me this question, and I'll email you back. And the number one thing I want all of you to walk away with, what are you going to do to be an anti-racist? Okay, next question. How do people not of color be the best ally and overcome the fear of getting it wrong? You know, Marilyn, I've had the fear as a black person of getting it wrong for 63 years in white spaces. So it's okay for you to get it wrong, but correct it and take it as an opportunity to get it right. And the more that you educate yourself in this messy, messy space, the more that you educate yourself that you're gonna be uncomfortable, but with the right intention. People know a good heart that's sincere and authentic versus someone's just checking a box. And, and so being proactive, being proactive with, with your education. Jackson, what if you were falsely accused of racism, what should you do? That's a fantastic question. And I think we, there's a lot of, there's a lot of layers there. You know, on one hand, when a person of color feels that you have been racist towards them, we have to not get defensive and better understand why they think that. But Jackson, I would love to have a conversation with you. Feel free to go in the chat and get my information. Thank you, Terry. What you liked in the presentation was the idea of being authentic in conversation and interactions with people, especially people of color. How can I do better at that, please? Uh, again, it's being proactive with your own education, not asking people of color or people identify differently to educate you. And by the way, I'm an educator, so ask me like you're asking now. Uh, these questions are actually really deep and they're part of a four hour workshop. <laughs> um, and, and so I'm not gonna blow it over, Terry, but uh, being proactive with your education um, I'll be more than glad if U.S. Rowing hasn't done it yet, 
Uh, for those of you who don't know, I'm also the co-chair of U.S. Rowing's Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion Committee, and we're, we're creating resources for this. And so I'll take one more question, and then I'll tell you a parting story. You can tell me, you know, your golden nugget. Uh, definitely follow me on Instagram. You'll find the most inclusive Instagram account in America. Uh, definitely reach out to me. Uh, for conversations, but I want to share the story um, about, if that's okay with all of you, I'm going to end with this story. Storytelling is how we begin to communicate. Storytelling is how we begin to better understand each other. Telling our own stories and not being afraid to talk about that maybe you do have racist people in your family, but you don't support it. That's storytelling. I have people come to me all the time and say, what do I do about racist aunt so-and-so who gets drunk during Thanksgiving and start blurting out racist things? I say, stop giving racist so-and-so alcohol. That's all. And so this is a story about a potato, an egg, and coffee beans. And a, a, a young person came home, slammed the door, went into the kitchen of her chef father, sat down, sighed and said, you know, life's not fair. I take two steps forward, end up with a step back. I don't understand. And the father said, okay, let me tell you, let me tell you a story. And so what he did was because he's a chef, he boiled three pots of water. He put potato in one, he put an egg in the other, and he put the coffee beans in the last one. About 20 minutes later, he pulls the potato out. He puts it on the table, and he says to his young child, touch that. And she touched it. She says, hot. He said, what else do you feel? She says, soft. And he said, yes, but it went in the water hard, and the water turned it soft. And then he took the egg out and he cracked it open. And he said, what do you see? And she rolled her eyes like any young person would. Well, it's a hard boiled egg, dad. And he goes, yes, but it went in liquid and the water turned it into, it turned it hard. And he got to the coffee and the co coffee beans. And he poured the water out from the coffee beans. And he said, taste this, what does this taste like? She said, it tastes like coffee, of course. And he goes, yes. The coffee changed his environment. The coffee changed his environment. It's up to you, friends from US Rowing, to change your environment. It's up to you to be the coffee bean and not allow your environment to change you. It's up to you to change your environment. Uh, James Baldwin said, to change anything, we must first be and to, to be to change anything, you must first face the things that we're we're not well that we're not, let me say that again. James Paul was said to change anything, we must first face it. To change anything, we must first face it. Face yourself, sit with othering, change the flavor of the water, change the flavor of your boathouse. I believe you can do this. I trust that you will do this. Let's continue the conversation. Share this webinar with others. Thank you for allowing me to have this time. Thank you for having this no small talk conversation with me. And I look forward to future conversations.